A special welcome, of course, goes to the speakers of this opening ceremony, to Ernst Ulrich von Weizsäcker, <laughs> to Helga Kromkolb, <laughs> Annika Daffert, <laughs> and Harald Frey. And of course, also to our moderator, Nora Laufer from Der Standard. <laughs> Thanks for doing this job. Uh, as already mentioned, there are different gr groups today in the auditorium, but also online, namely the participants, but I have learned also alumni from the two summer schools, and a lot of different student groups from different countries. One student group was already mentioned. It's a group from Egypt uh, colleagues, students and supervisors from the Alexandria uh, University Pharos in Egypt. And uh, this group uh, participates in the Green Building Solutions Summer Schools. It also contributes and is, it's also joining part of their lectures with the students of this summer school. Uh, there are also participants from the Young Scientists Summer Program of the International Institute of the Applied Systems Analysis in Luxembourg. And principally, this uh, ceremony, this uh, uh, meeting is open for any interested person. Thanks, of course, also to those people for their interest. Many thanks also to the Technical University for allowing us uh, to use this wonderful Kuppelsaal here. It's really a great uh, auditorium. It's really great. And uh, I also have to mention that uh, in order to keep the environmental impact of this meeting at the minimum, this event will be held according to the city of Vienna's criteria for eco events. That means we only offer organic food, regional and seasonal products. I've learned that the Green Building Solution Summer School takes place for the 11th time already. And this master program uh, provides education in sustainable and green building alternatives. It addresses new ways of thinking about designing, constructing, and using of buildings. The other summer school, the Alternative Economic and Monetary Systems Summer School, takes place for the ninth time. The goal of this summer school is to present and contribute to the evaluation of economic alternatives, an evaluation that takes also into account both natural limits, but also the human factor. Given the global challenges today we face, such as COVID-19 or the war in the Ukraine or the global climate crisis, the food crisis, the energy crisis, we are all aware that this topic becomes more and more important. That means we have to build a resilient and sustainable economy and society that respects the planetary boundaries. And these summer schools, both summer schools, want to contribute to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals by showing viable alternatives to processes and developments especially to those processes and developments that put economic strains on environmental and social boundaries. For those who do not know BOKU, BOKU is uh, one of the academic partners of this summer school, it, and it's a key partner in the organization and the development of these summer schools. Actually, both summer schools are permanently developed and improved on the feedbacks of uh, the past summer schools. Within Austria, Boku is a medium-sized university. Uh, today we have about 11,000 students, 3,000 employees, and it has a clear focus in research and education, so it's a very specialized university. Actually, we are celebrating the 105th anniversary of Boku. It has a very long tradition in interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary research, as already mentioned, with a clear focus and this clear focus both in research and education is uh, maybe best represented by the so-called competence fields 
of our universities along those competence fields, research and education, is uh, taking place. And these competence fields, for instance, are ecosystem management and biodiversity, agricultural production and food is typical for BOKU, renewable resources and the development and evaluation of new technologies, but also biotechnologies, landscape, water, habitat, and infrastructures, but also resources and the societal dynamics behind those are, are typical competence fields of our university. So I think BOKU is best suited to contribute to both summer schools, uh, both from the experience uh, in teaching and uh, research. And uh, both summer schools actually are a joint event from more universities than BOKU, so it's mainly BOKU, but also the Technical University, but many other institutions, including the ORD Student Housing. I wish you stimulating lectures and discussions. Have a great time in the next weeks with many new insights, experience, and hopefully also friends. All the best for the next weeks. Thank you very much. Right next up, Günther Jedwitzke, please. He is the CEO of ÖAD Student Housing. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure that you are all here. A special welcome to the students of the two summer universities. Well, that's the reason why we are here, fighting climate change. Uh, I, I will talk about reading books, what else, why reading books can change a lot. Then I will present the student housing, what we are doing, what is our main business, and finally, some words about the two summer universities. Well, I read these two books uh, quite a couple of years ago. I think Factor Fear I read in 1997. It's a book by Ernst Ulrich von Weizsäcker. And in this book, I read the first time about the passive house and how you could build future houses. And I was so impressed. And yeah, that influenced me enormously. And that was the reason why we built the first passive house afterwards. Two other very good books, uh, Haben oder Sein, To Have or To Be by Erich Fromm. It's, I think it says everything about what is going on or what could be better if we are more in the uh, science uh, world than in the having world. And the other uh, book is Man's Search of Meaning by Viktor Frankl. Last but not least, three books which I heavily recommend for the Ames Summer University, but only, not only for the Ames Summer University. Uh, if you read these two books, I think that will change everything what you've heard before. One is Change Everything by Christian Felber, who is also partner with the Economy for the Common Good by our Summer University. The other one is Vollgeld, it's uh, the German term for sovereign money. And finally, Das Geld-Syndrom, also available in English. Well, uh, a few words about our organization, ÖAD Student Housing. We are located in all the uh, university cities in Austria. We are a 100% subsidiary of the ÖAD, and we are a non-profit company. That's very important. Some facts and figures, uh, we accommodate around 10,000 international students per year, so quite a large number, three-fourths, uh, so 7,500 approximately in Vienna, and eight dorms are in passive house construction, or even better, that means nearly zero energy houses, and we're using uh, uh, solar energy through photovoltaic systems at all these houses. Well, as I mentioned before, uh, when I read the book uh, by Professor Weizsäcker about passive houses, that was in 2005 in the world, the first student dorm in passive house construction in Vienna. Now we have experience for nearly 17 years and we are still very, very happy with the house. Another example in Leoben, we built that for the Montana University in Leoben. It's nearly completely in wooden construction. It's a passive house with photovoltaic on top, and it's also a fantastic project for up to 200 students. Here you see uh, how it looks inside. It's the entrance. It looks more like a hotel than a student dorm. 
we look for very high quality. Yeah, why are we here? I like also philosophy and I like also some phil philosophical sayings. Here I like this saying very much, it's by Victor Hugo. Uh, there is nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. And hopefully we can present you these ideas. Another saying by Wilhelm von Humboldt, which fits also very good to these two summer universities, I think. It's very important, enlighten, enlighten yourself and then affect others by what you are. So hopefully you will do that after the summer university. Well, there are problems and there are solutions. Uh, we will concentrate at these two summer universities on the solutions. <clears throat> Just an example for, for Ames, uh, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, public debt in Austria is 280 billion in 2019. What do you think, uh, what is interest and compound interest in this debt? Is it 10%, 30%, 50% or more? Any guess? Well, it's 97%. So if we wouldn't have uh, uh, financed uh, by banks or government, uh, government bonds, we wouldn't have any, any debts right now. And it's the same for, for all the countries. Well, another saying uh, by Henry Ford 110 years ago, it's well enough that people of the nation do not understand our banking and monetary system, for if they did, I believe there would be a revolution before tomorrow morning. And I think this is, is still valid because the monetary and financial system hasn't changed at all. Well, I mentioned that before, the idea will be presented at Ames Vollgeld or sovereign money or positive money, which is the English term. Just to give you an overview, what, what, what are the big advantages of sovereign money? It's, there is no, nearly no problem any longer with interest and compound interest. The economy no longer has to grow, can grow, but has not to grow. Money creation, that's also very important. Uh, only by the national bank, currently 90% of, of uh, money creation is by private banks, or up to 95% right now. And also very important, money uh, at your bank account is 100% secure. Well, Maggie Thatcher uh, in the 90s, uh, uh, she said there is no alternative, and we changed that to there is no alternative for alternatives. I think you know this game in, in German or in Austria, it's called Das Kaufmännische Talent, DKT. In English, it's Monopoly. So I think you know it. Six players start with quite a, a lot of money. Then they buy uh, different things. They get 200 or 400 euro each time when they cross the, the, the line. And at the end, there is one big winner and the others are bankrupt. So that's quite similar what is going on in our monetary and financial system. Last but not least, uh, what I will tell you for the summer university, come on, start now, be courageous, zack, 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 and be clever. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the next person does know a lot about problems and solutions, Helga Kromkorp. She is a climate researcher and head of the AEMS Summer University. Thank you very much. You might ask yourself why a meteorologist is talking about monetary systems and economic systems, uh, but uh, it's rather obvious. Uh, we will not be able to solve the crisis within the present systems. We will have to have changes in the present systems, uh, otherwise we will probably um, uh, not solve the climate, pro uh, climate crisis in the time available to solve it. Um, the, uh, the AMS, the, uh, the Summer School for Alternative and e Economic and Monetary Systems, uh, dates back to an idea by Günter Jedlitzka, who never mentions that, but he's the initiator of both summer schools. And he, talk <coughs> he, he approached me and said, uh, um, my feeling is that uh, students, uh, university students, and of course the general public, uh, know too little about the monetary and financial systems. 
And um, I quite agreed with him, uh, not only because I myself know too little about him, but also because I really think that uh, this is one of the areas where uh, what is taught at universities uh, has, there's a, a considerable gap between what is taught at universities and what the real world, uh, uh, what, what happens in the real world. And so we uh, conceived this summer school together with a lot of help from others and from, from people who are um, more professional in, in the topics of uh, economic and monetary systems. And uh, uh, thankfully, Boko was uh, willing to host this, uh, this summer school. And so we started out with, um, yeah, about 50 students in the first year. And we found that uh, the students, in fact, knew very, very little. Uh, this has changed dramatically. And I, I don't think it's just due to our summer school. Uh, there's others also who have, who have uh, started discussing these topics. And uh, we just started our summer school, the ninth summer school, this afternoon. And, uh, even the short period already showed me that uh, the, the students that come to the summer school, uh, at least uh, those with an economic background, uh, have much better and deeper understanding of um, the system, uh, also of the financial system, than those students nine years ago. And I think that is something which um, uh, is, is a cause for hope. Uh, because in order to change a system, I mean, you can destroy a system without changing it, without understanding it, but you cannot build up a better system without understanding it. So I think it's very important that we really deal with these systems and try to understand them. And what the summer school is offering is not the solution, but it's offering a whole portfolio of possible solutions. Uh, what I have also noticed as a climatologist is that very many of the economists and the financial specialists uh, have good solutions for the specific problems they are aware of. But if you ask them, what does this mean for resource use? What does it mean for climate change? How do you accommodate these problems? Then very often there's no real answer. So this shows me that uh, we still have a lot of work to do. And the summer schools are one of the places where this work is happening, where we try to interact with uh, different, different disciplines uh, and also keep track of this uh, ecological and, uh, sustainability that is also a necessary part of sustainability. So uh, for the students of the summer school, uh, you can expect a lot of ideas, some of them new to you, others maybe not so new, uh, and a lot of discussion about what these specific ideas mean in terms of future development. Um, you will not go out of the summer school with the final program of how the world, what the world must look like and what the economic and the financial system must look like and the steps how to get there. We cannot offer that. Uh, but I think the complex problems we're dealing with cannot offer that kind of solution. Uh, in these complex problems, we really need to discuss uh, because there's no purely scientific solution that is valid because there's a lot of um, um, uh, uh, subjective, normative aspects that go into this. And this means that societies have to discuss these topics and have to find solutions that are suitable for their culture, for their situation, uh, and uh, this is not something which can be um, just um, developed by scientists on their own. So I think it's important that uh, as many people as possible have enough knowledge to discuss these issues and thus uh, help societies the world over uh, to, to uh, move towards systems that are more compatible with sustainability. And we're very happy to have students from very many different countries uh, because this also enriches the discussion with the different cultures, the different cultural backgrounds, the different political systems, and the different educational backgrounds that you're bringing to the school. So um, I invite you all uh, to uh, join in this joint effort of uh, finding solutions, of uh, discussing solutions, and of going back out into your own universities, into the world, and hopefully uh, carrying the ideas that you 
got in our in in Vienna in these two three weeks uh, with you and uh, uh, influencing as many people as possible to also start thinking about these problems. Thank you very much. We now heard the word solutions quite a lot of times. The nice thing is about the second summer university, Green Building Solutions, the word is already in there. And I'd like to welcome Karin Stieldorf, the academic head of the second summer university. Well, today is my role to, um, to represent the Vienna University of Technology. So a warm welcome here at the Technical University of Vienna. Well, uh, the motto of this university is to bring technology to the people and to people. It is um, Austria's largest research and educational institution and in the field of technology and natural resources. More than 4,000 uh, um, researchers and um, um, in five main research areas are here at eight, facu at eight faculties. The content of the studies offered is derived from the excellent research we do here. More than 27 students in 66 degree programs benefit from this. Um, as a driver of innovation, Wien strengthens the business location, facilitates cooperation and contributes to the prosperity of the society. Uh, as a result of the, the research and what we are doing here, there will also, there, we have um, several buildings specific, specifically done in built, uh, built as buildings itself that will also have the possibility to see in the next time at least four of them. Three of them, there's Lisi House, there is another house for, that is shown at the EBA at the moment, the International Building Exhibition. So we can also see you the, show you the practical uh, outcomes of, of the research. Well, I'm very much looking forward to you, as, to you many students here from many countries to work with you. And uh, I'm, in, I'm really I'm going to enjoy and hope you are enjoying uh, the common research on practical work that we are doing on, uh, within the research project based on the knowledge you will get within the next three weeks. So a very warm welcome to all of you from the side of Vienna University of Technology. Thank you. So thank you for all those introductionary words. Now we change to our panelists. You've heard a lot about Ernst Ulrich von Weizsäcker now, now you will hear from him. He is an environmental researcher and former politician, and I would kindly ask you for your presentation now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Nora, I have a request to you, or oh, to you to uh, switch my slides as I say so. Mm -hmm. I was stupid enough preparing my presentation all in German, but uh, I shall be speaking in it. Okay, next please. Well, I was invited to speak about the 50 years of the famous book, The Limits to Growth by the Club of Rome, in which they had a fairly primitive mathematics, grabbing five parameters and established the mutual mathematical relations, and with that instrument, predicting the future of mankind and of the planet for the next 150 years. OK, and this is the result. Uh, population went up and finally was going down again, pollution the same more or less, and the most alarming thing, natural resources would go down essentially to zero. Okay, next please. This is the team uh, that did it. Uh, the young people are those who wrote it, and the older man, Jay Forrester, was the architect of the whole thing. He also had this wonderful mathematical tool in his head 
which was called Dynamo. And with Dynamo, you could produce the future of humankind. Okay, next please. If eight billion people are inhabitants of our planet, planet Earth, and each one of them has a consumption pattern more or less of what today's America has, we would need six planets. Unfortunately, we have got only one. Next. Um, all those warnings would never stop the desire for more growth. Next. Next. Um, one of the uh, intention for more and more and more and more growth was to overcome poverty. But regarding the comparison between 1820, 1970, and 2015, you see the red part is poverty. So essentially, we have already overcome poverty. But still, all journalists of the world say, we have to fight poverty. You know? And this legitimizes all kind of nonsense. Next. Well, the new dogma for growth is the Sustainable Development Goals, 17 number. And they, next please, essentially are 11 aggressive imperatives for more growth, more growth, more growth. Yeah. This is what they call sustainable. Of course, it is not sustainable at all. But everybody thinks we, des uh, we deserve it, you know. And then three of the Sustainable Development Goals are for um, the environment, climate, oceans, and biodiversity. But this makes sense only if you put the picture like you have it on the right side, not on the left side. The left side is rubbish. The right side essentially says the base of it all is natural resources, including biodiversity, oceans, and climate. Meaning, next, if this goes down the drain, nothing is left for um, wealth, well-being, you know? But people don't like this story. It is not popular. So they rather go for the other picture. Next, please. On climate, we have lots of terrible um, disasters. I don't go into details. Next. And the global warming goes on relentlessly. Next, please. The trouble is the following. There are more or less eight different parts of our economy, such as food, transport, manufacturing, etc. And for each one of them, you have a strict correlation from left to right, wealth, economic growth, and from bottom to top, the CO2 emissions per capita. And you see a clear correlation. Whenever countries get richer, the little dots are the countries, um, you have more CO2 emissions. This is the core of the tragedy. And as long as we say, oh no, we do something wonderful for climate, uh, we are liars. We don't accept truth. Next. We absolutely need a decoupling of economic wealth from the damages done by global 
the woman. And this is exactly what the new economy should realize and ex uh, explain next. You know, uh, it is in the habit of our countries that we are only concerned with what is happening in our country. So in the Germans have uh, CO2 and equivalent uh, emissions of 2% of the globe. But all that they are proud of is reducing those 2% down to 1.8% or so. And believe so that is the strategy of our uh, getting uh, a stop on global warming. And for Austria, it's half a percent. Okay. So, domestic climate policy in terms of physics is complete nonsense. We have to have global um, strategy for reducing global warming. Next. Um, we, it is good for the world if Austria or Germany or other countries like the Netherlands prove that it is possible to reduce the um, emissions dramatically and still have better wealth. Next. Now, this is a very uh, problematic thing the so-called negative emissions. This is what the industrialists love. Essentially, they say, oh yes, we go to Nigeria or some other place and ask for building, uh, for a, a, an additional tree culture. And the additional reduction of carbon dioxide by those trees we are selling to the stupid um, Europeans um, so that they can claim climate neutrality in their industry, which of course is complete nonsense. Next. Well, there are firms, I mean, uh, not serious firms, saying we sell you negative emissions and then they, for instance, have rapidly growing eucalyptus forests. But I used to be a professor of biology and know that the way of eucalyptus, um, well, getting further generations of eucalyptus means they need burning. So, they have the eucalyptus growing and then burning. But the money, meanwhile, has already reached the uh, European industries. So it's complete madness. Next. Those negative emissions in the EU German uh, jargon, uh, usually called nature-based solutions or offsets, are the biggest enemy to the indigenous people. The picture says, our nature is not your solution. You know? Next. It's not only climate that is worrying me, it's also the destruction of biological diversity. If you have the vertebrates uh, divided in three categories, um, essentially our animals for slaughter, ourselves, we are also vertebrates, and what is left for wild animals. And here you see the percentages. Two-thirds of the vertebrates' weight is animals that we uh, cultivate for, for slaughter, for our meat eating, you know? And we are uh, nearly one third. 
So only 3% of the vertebrate weight on Earth is wild animals. Next. The conventional morale, wash your hands and all will be well, says uh, the mother or the father of the boy, is simply not good enough. There are waves, the COVID-19 economic recession, climate change and biodiversity even the worst. This is part of reality. But we prefer not to, uh, not to acknowledge that. Next. We absolutely also need a decoupling of our well-being from the killing of wild animals. Next. In addition, we absolutely need a stabilization of the world uh, population. Next. Roughly, in 1950, you can say, we still have been living in an empty world. The term came from Herman Daly, who used to be the chief economist of the World Bank. And today, however, we are full of people and of their consumption. And that essentially means the full world is not sustainable. Almost by definition. Next. So, a few positive things. Next. This is uh, already <coughs> has been uh, kindly mentioned. Factor four, factor five. Where we, as authors, show that a fivefold increase of energy and material efficiency is available. Next. For instance, passive house. <laughs> that is really a fantastic invention. My family and I are living in a so-called passive house, meaning that we have essentially no heating cost. Next. And now the question is, is a factor of five technically, in terms of physics, possible? Everybody would say no. But it is. Look at Mount Everest. And then uh, I'm always asking my students, how many kilowatt hours would you need to lift a bucket of water of 10 kilograms from sea level to the top of Mount Everest? And the typical answer I got when I was teaching in California was something like 10,000 kilowatt hour, because that damn uh, mountain is very high and the water is heavy, etc. Um, this is wrong. Next, please. The answer in terms of physics is one quarter of a kilowatt hour. A kilowatt hour is an unbelievable powerhouse. But we waste it no end because it doesn't cost a thing. Next. Next uh, topic is the circular economy. The world is now only 8.6% circular, which is mad. Next. And sorting the um, remains of our uh, well, wealth is not good enough. Next. In particular for special metals that you need, for instance, for photovoltaics and for wind energy and many other things. There, the global recycling rate is below 1%. Next, please. Well, the, uh, for climate action, we also need the circular economy. Next. This is also the uh, opinion of uh, Franz Timmermans of the EU Commission. Next. We need new business models which lead to recovery of uh, the circular economy. Next. But who the hell wants the cheaponomics? Well, of course, it is the manufacturer of masses. Next. Then remanufacturing is something like a factor of five better than just recycling. Next. Uh, 
and the German uh, car supplier uh, Bosch has uh, decided to have 9,000 products all manufactured by remanufacturing next. This is a political thing of today. Everybody in Austria and in all countries is complaining about uh, high prices for energy, which is nonsense. It has always been very high, but it went down and down and down and down, and in 200 years, it went down by a factor of three or so. And now that finally energy got more expensive, everybody is now interested in efficiency. Before, nobody was interested. Next. Another fascinating thing is solar energy. Next. Um, solar energy, photovoltaics, has become 300 times cheaper than it used to be 40 years ago. Isn't that fantastic? Next. Well, that should also lead to a discussion on uh, motorized vehicles. Next. Here you see a one-way road in Bangkok. Six lanes, all in one direction, <laughs> meaning there are oodles of cars, all of them internal combustion engines. And then, uh, meaning more than a billion cars, um, internal combustion engines, is there on our roads. And now your question is, how many of the um, owners of those cars are willing to scrap the car and buy a new um, electric car? And we, uh, had a little chat about that a moment ago. Uh, not too many. My most optimistic guess is 15%. Remaining 85% who don't, don't want that. Next. So we absolutely need the climate neutral combustion engine. For that, of course, we can make use of the cheap solar energy for splitting water into oxygen and hydrogen, and then marry hydrogen with carbon dioxide. What do you get? Methanol. And methanol is a wonderful substitute for, for um, um, well, fuels. Next. Next. Finally, a few words on politics, next. The German advisory board on uh, global environmental questions has developed the idea of the so-called budget approach, saying that individuals of all countries have identical rights, licenses, if you wish, of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. But the old industrialized countries have essentially gobbled up all those licenses. So they would have to go to developing countries asking for additional licenses. Next. That would lead to the um, Indian Minister of Economic Affairs to say, oh, that could be profitable. We phase out coal, and instead sell to those uh, bloody stupid Europeans uh, some of our licenses. Next. <coughs> and the European industries, and similarly the American, would in large style buy so-called green hydrogen, or ammonia, or methanol, from North Africa, from Australia, and many other countries, which get richer by it. And we are climate neutral. Next. Um, in a new book, which I uh, published so far only in German, I'm also saying that much of what I have been uh, telling 
in terms of technology and politics is unpopular. We need something like a new enlightenment. Next. This is a picture of the book, which has indeed a long chapter on a new enlightenment that we need to grasp why the hell we absolutely need a radical change of our civilization. Thank you. Next. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think this will be a really interesting panel discussion. I saw that one person was eagerly writing down mm -hmm. notes, Helga Grompkort. Um, please, your presentation. Thank you. I decided to make do without pictures uh, and just um, talk. Uh, it's very difficult after this very wide uh, range of topics that uh, uh, my uh, free speaker um, covered uh, to still find a niche, but um, I think I would like to talk to you about the question why uh, do we need sustainability? I mean, we're talking about achieving a good life for all within the planetary boundaries, and that is one way of saying uh, we want sustainability. Uh, we could also all say sustainability means that we need a global way of life that could go, off, go on forever and ever and ever without depleting the resources and without um, overloading the sinks that our global ecosystem offers. Um, if you think of it that way, the question is what is the alternative? What is the alternative to sustainability? And it's obviously, it obviously means leaving our children, their children, uh, with an unlivable planet. Uh, no matter whether that is due to a lack of food, a lack of water, a lack of space, of area where to live, or because of radioactive contamination uh, as a result of nuclear war over food, water, space, whatever. So, we are already experiencing what this um, non-sustainable lifestyle means. Um, it is taking shape in form of, the cl of climate change, and everybody, I think, is by now aware of climate change. We're experiencing it now in Vienna. Karina uh, uh, mentioned 36 degrees, which is terribly hot. Well, for many of our students, that is not terribly hot, uh, but uh, they, have, they have experienced even much higher temperatures. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, for any society, a deviation from the normal is difficult to cope with. And uh, whether you have a normal temperature that is much lower or higher, what climate change is doing, it is increasing the te temperatures and temperature increases. Uh, um, even more difficult to handle than temperature decreases to a certain extent. It's more difficult to protect yourself against heat than it is to protect yourself against cold. Um, so I think most people are quite willing to accept that we have to do something about climate change. We have to do, we have to do something to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, but um, beyond that, when you get to concrete measures, it becomes much more difficult to find agreement uh, for many reasons. But um, just uh, imagine, um, now you are, we also have students from GBS here, um, the new, the new uh, challenge for architects will really not be how to build a new house as well and sustainable as possible, but the main challenge will be how to upgrade old houses because we just cannot afford a huge number of new houses. So the whole, the whole um, career sort of shifts or the, the, the intention or the, the, the job that you have to do, the task shifts completely. And that is not something that um, everybody is happy about uh, because you have much more freedom, much more, more possibility to express your own, your own creativity uh, if you build a new house somewhere uh, where there is nothing there so far. 
Uh, but um, looking at the resources needed to build houses, and I'm not only talking about the, about the energy that the house will need afterwards, but also about the energy that is embodied in the, in the resources you use, but also the resources themselves. Um, who would have thought that sand would become a scarce resource? Uh, who would have thought that wood in Austria, a country full of forests, would become a scarce resource. So we also have to look at, at these aspects, and this changes, this changes careers completely. And since we have Harald Frey here, uh, an, an expert in, in mobility, uh, reducing carbon dioxide emissions also requires a completely different system of mobility. This is one point we've already discussed. Um, I do not believe uh, that, and uh, uh, Hans Ulrich von Weizsäcker agrees with me, but uh, the way he presented it, it looks as though we just have to replace cars by cars with different motors. No, we will have to do with much fewer cars. We will have to do, do much more walking, bicycling, using public transport. And this means we have to change the whole way where we plan cities because cities have to be planned in a manner to make it possible to use a bicycle walk or use public transport. So uh, saying reducing CO2 is sort of uh, simple and everybody can agree, but if you go down to the, to the concrete facts, what has to be done, uh, this changes a lot. And of course, with all these changes, you also have changes in the economy. You have, you have winners and losers and um, also uh, 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 repercussions into the financial systems. Uh, but climate change is just one way in which we are exceeding boundaries, in which uh, we are not sustainable, um, and overcharging our, our global ecosystem. Of course, there's also the whole social uh, issue. But before I get to that, uh, was already mentioned, we have a problem with biodiversity loss, we have a problem with acidification of the oceans, we have a problem with excessive land use change, and so on. So there's many ways in which we are exceeding the ecological capacity of our planet. And uh, the underlying root cause is what we really need to address. And this underlying root cause uh, has very much to do with the economic and the financial system. Uh, they are at the root of many of these ecological problems we have. But as I said, there's also the social problems. There are social problems in which I don't want to go into in detail, but you know that the, 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 the gap between rich and poor is increasing, that uh, 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 increasingly small number of people have an increasingly large portion of, glo of global wealth. Um, so this, here also we have a problem. We have a problem of, of um, um, inequity between countries, but also uh, problems in, within the countries. Um, so we need to also look at the social aspects. Uh, in a way a bit different, but uh, essentially saying the same thing as uh, uh, Professor Weizsäcker. Uh, I uh, usually say that the ecological sustainability is the basis for a life. It makes it possible. Uh, the social aspect makes life enjoyable. That is what we live for. Uh, that is uh, relation with other humans, uh, how we interact, um, uh, families, friends. Um, that is what makes life enjoyable. And the economic part of sustainability is really just a method, a way of making the other two uh, sustainabilities possible, of making it possible to live a good life within the, the limits of the planetary boundaries. Um, economists, uh, and especially um, politicians, should be aware that this is the role of economy, that economy is not a goal in itself. A thriving economy is not a goal in itself. Economy should serve the social and the ecological sustainability. Um, the same is true of the financial system. The financial system uh, is also losing sight of its original purpose. 
The original purpose was to make the interchange easier, to make um, economy easier, but meanwhile it has become a goal in, its, in itself. And uh, these are things that need changes, and they, they express themselves very strongly in, for instance, in the mission statement of banks. If you look at mission statement in banks, they do not say uh, uh, our mission is to enable societal uh, welfare and uh, to stay within the global uh, planetary boundaries. Uh, taking account of economic necessities. But on the contrary, they say our goal is to make profit, um, good <coughs> run economically sound bank, taking account of uh, environment and of social aspects. <coughs> this turns things completely around. And this is, I think, where we really need to, to, um, to, uh, to address uh, these problems. Uh, there's also one aspect which I just want to mention because it's often overlooked. We often look at, at states and uh, what their emissions are. Uh, but more recently, there's been quite a number of publications uh, looking at individual wealth and how that correlates with um, emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, or um, uh, ecological footprint, if you want. Uh, and we find that there's a huge, a huge disparity here, that the, that the, the wealthy, the 1%, 10% wealthy of this, of this world, no matter from which country, have an enormously high footprint. So this also is something which we must address in our economic and financial systems. We must also address this. It is something which is very rarely talked about, uh, but it is very, very relevant. Uh, because um, some, some studies show, for instance, that if the most wealthy 10% of the world do not change in their habits, in their emissions, we will not be able to reach the Paris goals in climate. Uh, so that is something which really needs addressing, even if it is not very popular to talk about such things. So uh, is the situation hopeless? Not at all. I think we have a lot of problems ahead of us, but we also have an unexpected window of opportunity. We have a window of opportunity that was partly created by not so much the, the health problem of corona, but more the, the uh, economic uh, repercussions of the measures that were taken in order to uh, handle the health situation. Uh, this has meant that, at least for Europe, that is definitely true. This has meant that um, the economy suffered, the economies suffered, uh, but governments are helping the economies to recover. And by helping them, they can also impose certain rules. They can, for instance, uh, attach strings of sustainability to any kind of help they give. Uh, this is partly being pushed by the European Union, uh, but if you look at what different countries do, you can see a wide range of uh, some countries um, uh, spending some 20% of the money, the recovery money, for sustainable, sustainable projects, and others spending 60 and 80%. So we should all be getting towards those 60 and 80%. By the way, Austria is rather on the lower end. Uh, we have also a window of opportunity through the economic uh, repercussions of the Ukraine war, between, uh, or rather, maybe more correctly, the, the economic war that is being fought in parallel to the military war. Uh, this, again, has pushed uh, the European countries, but also some others, to, uh, towards more renewable energy. So there's different... Um, uh, external factors that work or can work in the direction of more sustainability. It is not something which goes on its own. Uh, we really need to make sure that decisions are taken in the right, in the right direction. And I think we, have, we are in a critical time period now. We're in these 10 years that are, this decade that we're in, is really the critical period in which uh, we have to take dec decisions towards sustainability. And one of the very, very first decisions we have to take is a decision towards peace. 
Peace and sustainability go hand in hand. You cannot have sustainability and war at the same time. So we need to make sure that, uh, we, we, uh, that peace is achieved as soon as possible in order to make sustainability possible. Um, the, the, uh, the SDGs also uh, contain the commitment by all the signatories that they will uh, work towards peace. And, um, and um, the, uh, a recent study by, by um, uh, the, the Swedish uh, Institute on, on Peace and War uh, said we cannot live in an environment of peace until we have made peace with the environment. And I think the opposite is also true. We need both, and I think this is one of the, one of the issues we really need to address um, because um, um, falling into the into back into the, a, a, a thinking that uh, force can solve problems, uh, that the person with or the, the state with more more uh, warheads, more more brutal force um, should win. Uh, that is not uh, a state. We have been working for many years, many decades really, towards a more peaceful society. And I think this is something we should not uh, lose sight of. We need a peaceful in order to uh, become a sustainable society. And I think both is within reach, even if the t in, in, in the times we're in now. Thank you very much. Now you've heard a lot from the scientific side, now I would like to change to another side, to someone who's urging and demanding politicians to listen to those scientists. Annika Daffert, she is an environmental activist with Fridays for Future Austria. One second. There we go. Good evening to everyone. First, I want to thank for you for the invitation. I am very excited to be here. My name is Annika Daffert. I am 20 years old and an environmental and climate activist with Fridays for Future Austria. I've been striking in Salzburg since I was 16 years old. Actually, the first protest I've ever attended was one I organized myself. I often get questions about how I got into climate activism and how one becomes a climate activist. I can only speak for myself there and how I got into Fridays for Future. I think there are a few components to it. On top of all, of course, Greta Thunberg, who initiated the movement and now still takes an active part in it. Then my parents and the way I grew up. I've always been told to look out for our nature to protect animals and just be aware of the resources we use. And without the support of my parents, I would not be where I am today. And of course, basic knowledge about the climate crisis. And when I say basic, I mean basic. I was convinced we should take care of, take care of the polar bears and everything. And I learned about the Kyoto Protocol in school. Yeah. There's one thing that was different in 2019 in comparison to all the times before when people tried to raise awareness about the climate crisis. It suddenly was accessible to everyone. The internet and social media surely helped there. But suddenly, a little girl from Sweden had a voice and was heard. So why shouldn't everyone? Greta Thunberg didn't invent a movement. She gave people the confidence to use their voices, like I did and still do. So in Austria, we've never been the country to be known for big protests. In Salzburg, for example, Fridays for Future managed to organize one of the biggest protests in the history of the city. So people generally believe in our more or less democratic strong democracy, right? Or do people just don't know how to start? When I decided to organize the first protest in Salzburg, I had to call a now friend of mine to ask how to even register a protest at the police. It's actually not that hard if you know which legal text to read. But there's people doing that for you now. 
There's protests being organized, actions being planned, and meetings hosted. But since the pandemic started, the hype around Fridays for Future decreased, and also the momentum for real climate action sank. How come people seem to care less every year when the effort, effects of the climate crisis get more drastic? I don't know. I really don't. In Austria, some of you might already know this, we don't even have a current climate protection law, which means that there is one in place, but its targets ended in 2020. So we've been talking about lowering emissions and reaching the goal of climate neutrality until 2040 without any plan or interim goals. Can you imagine, in eight years, we should have reduced our emissions by 55% um, according to the EU. And in 18 years, we want to reach climate neutrality. That's not that long anymore. So we've wasted essentially two years without a climate protection law, without reduction targets in every sector, and without actually involving scientists in all this process. Did you know that the old climate protection law, which is still in use, includes a panel of repre representatives of all parties, of the economy, and some more organization, but only one scientist, one scientist among 30 other people representing organizations with interests that are sometimes diametrical to climate protection. So what happens if we still don't include science in political decisions? What happens if we continue like that? What future will await us? To be blunt, it's a future I personally don't want to live in. It's a thought process that's easy to follow. The world climate gets hotter. More and more areas become, become inhabitable. People have to leave their homes and realize that there are countries in the world that knowingly destroyed their land for years and years. The pieces of land where plants can still grow on and people can still survive on get smaller. People get envious about what others have. People fight for the survival in these small spots on earth where it's still possible. Do you think that with that all will happen with friendly negotiations and compromises with smiling handshakes after some bilateral talks at conferences? I don't think so. Here in Austria, people are already starting to fear winter because of the missing gas. But we all know that the technology to replace gas heating with something else has been known for years. Companies that make profit from causing the climate crisis are now making more profit with that at the expense of normal people like you and me. We live in a system that seems to destroy us and itself. That sounds scary, doesn't it? Does it make you sad, angry, helpless, hopeless? It certainly does that to me sometimes. But you can channel that, channel it into, channel it into change and hope join movements, and make politicians do their jobs. I also often get asked about visions and about hope. Of course I have visions. And yes, I do still hope. I dream of a future where everyone can live a good life. I dream of a future where I don't have to worry about the climate crisis because it's self-evident that governments take care of it. I dream of a future where human rights not only exist on paper, because that's what climate activism and climate action actually is about, about humankind not destroying itself. So coming back to the first question, how can people be climate activists? For me, the climate crisis is so close and real and obvious and dangerous that I don't really understand how someone could not be one but it, because it, it affects all of us. So if you can, join a movement. Being here already makes you the perfect candidates to be on the forefront of change. If you can find the time, take it. 
everyone has a place in the climate movement. Think about your own visions for your future and what you're willing to do to make that happen. Those visions, those dreams, will make it worth it in the end. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And last but not least, Harald Frey. You've heard he's a mobility expert at the TU Vienna. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Both the economic and the monetary systems are deeply uh, influenced by the transport infrastructure, especially if we do not take into account just the traditional one, but especially if we focus on the modern, on the digital transport infrastructure like the internet. If we go back over 10,000 of years and we take a look on the transport infrastructure, then we have to say, well, it was very well adapted to the natu natural environment. The impact and the damage was very low in accordance to the predominant way of mobility, which was walking. And with walking mobility, we had a good experience. About four million years of upright walk. Well, we had a so-called negative feedback loop, so we know, we knew when we tried to get faster then we get very fast exhausted, and then we have to stop, we have to breathe, we have to get oxygen, we have to stop, we have to rest. So uh, this was quite a good experience we had over the time, and we still have when we walk, and we do not use external energy. But of course we try to make the life until now comfortable, we make it, try to make it easier for us, then we used animals to uh, get from A to B, them to bring goods from A to B over longer distances, but all these vehicles or these possibilities had the advantage uh, that they were very well adapted to their natural environments. So they had the footpath, they do not need an extra infrastructure, and there were different animals on different uh, areas around the globe. They were very well adapted to the natural environments, so they helped us quite well. And then we began to, to invent, because we were very uh, inventive, a very inventive species, we began to invent uh, the wheel, for instance, and uh, first of all in the history, we need some kind of pavement, we need some kind of sealed infrastructure to move this wheel from A to B. There are societies around the globe uh, which invented a wheel, but they didn't, never used it. They just had it as a symbol, but they don't, don't never tried to use it in different areas around the globe. And when we used this on different carriage ways, then we tried to look, and uh, it was very important, that we gave back nature what we take, take out. So if we pave uh, things and uh, we reduce or the, the capacity for nature and uh, enlarge the ecological footprint, then we need an alley, then we need trees that give us shadow, and of course they give back uh, what we take out of nature. So this was a very good uh, thing over 10,000 of years, and there were not really problems coming from the transport infrastructure to the environment at all. But this radically changed, uh, even in comparison to human mankind, when the external energy came into the system. So we were accepted and we were, had a lot of experience, as I mentioned, with walking speed, but then we accelerated the speed in the system in a dramatically short time in the system, and the question until now is, did we have to, uh, the time to learn and to control this uh, means of transportation in the right way? And when we take a look outside on the problems in the transport sector, environmental damage, a lot of uh, traffic facilities, etc., then we say, well, we did not really uh, are able until right now to deal with this system, with this motorized new technical system. It is a technical system that helps us to make life more comfortable, to make it more easier. Like most of us argument when they take this smartphone and say, well, it makes the life more comfortable, it makes it more easier. We use uh, the computer, we check the internet, uh, we do not read books anymore, the same time we did some decades ago, but it makes life more comfortable. 
And this is quite interesting because it's the same argumentation when the people get it into the car. Well, they do not have to use uh, body energy. They have the external energy. They use two tons of steel to move from A to B with high speed. Well, it seems to be more comfortable for them. So this changed the system dramatically on several levels, especially on the level of infrastructure, because what, which was first adapted to nature in, the, in harmony with the surroundings, needed much more space. We needed much more energy. You need machines, of course. Human manpower at all was not sufficient for that, so there were some preconditions that were responsible that those infrastructure are right now present and were still built all over the world. And, of course, it was, I would say, dominated by a certain sector of industry and that uh, said, well, we all know that it's not God-given, so it's ma made for mankind. They were said, well, build those kinds of infrastructure and we will have a better life over decades. So you see, expressways will solve downtown traffic problems. So this was the promotion that promoted from the industry, especially from the oil and from the car industry. So and on the same time, even if you see the left picture from the 1920s, 1930s on from the US, it was clear that those infrastructures will not, will not solve the problem, but it will, uh, it will uh, double it or it will strengthen it. And these are the actual problems we are right now seeing in all over the world when we build motorways, when we extend, extend the infrastructure for these kind of means of transportation, then we will produce a lot of problems, environmental damage and so on. And of course, of also cultural and societal damage. That's one part. We discussed about passenger transport and also good transport. But uh, the other part of the summer school is dealing with monetary system. And also these monetary systems has a, have a deeply uh, correlation with the transport sector. You see a typical picture maybe uh, trying some people uh, bringing money or jewelry from A to B. Uh, and there came pirates and uh, did some robberies and maybe a, only a part of the money, money, money uh, came to the destination. This was a typical, what we call today, trickle-down effect. So the pirates came and took 80% of the money and just 20% of the magistry maybe come to the uh, destination. This is completely different to the monetary system today because we can transfer numbers which are nothing else than digital numbers somewhere else around the globe in the internet from A to B without resistance. You can transfer millions and billions of euros, dollars or whatever around the globe. So it's completely different than it was over thousands of years. If you want to transport money, which is nothing else than energy, then you have to ex expect losses over long distances. And even there, we try to reduce all these resistances over the decades. You see the development of tolls after the gut rating rounds, the development of costs for, a for air freight, and so on. And with, this uh, with the reduction of those tolls, there was a growth of big companies and of big structures at all. So they, of course, helped the growth of transnational cooperation. And who pays for this development? Well, the public pays. And until now, there's an, this old survey from Estes in 1969. He said, well, there's a ratio of about one to five, uh, this is a conservative assumption, of the costs to the general public of the profits of the US corporations. So the network of banks, this is an energy without resistance, I mentioned that is not possible in the real system. So what happened? We increased the speed over the decades rapidly and uh, over the time in the systems, and we didn't save time. But what happened? We increased the length of our trips, which was about a near, in our near field, in the past, the shops, our social relationships, they were somewhere else around the globe right now. There are the products coming from China, there are the products coming from somewhere all over the globe. Our relationships are somewhere all, all over the globe. And if we want to get those goods, or if we want to meet friends, we need a lot of transport energy. So, this is not just the physical transportation system we know, so not, but there's also the internet, as I mentioned before. And what left? Well, the old shops, the small-scale entities. They were here. And what is on the other side? The supply chain for the big cities, for the big infrastructures, where we resource incent in incentive somewhere outside about the city, and related, of course, to 
high energy consumption and to a certain amount of uh, transportation. So the societies with fast transport systems, they have the same travel time budget as societies with sustainable slow mobility, but much more environmental, social, and economic problems. And all the decisions for investments for in faster transport infrastructure, which are argued right now all over the globe, are based on the consumption of time saving by increasing speed, which does not exist in the system. But what happened to the cities and to the areas where we live, especially also our settlements? Well, they also changed by increasing speed. It not, it's not just only the transport sector who transformed our life, but it's the neighborhood, the neighborhoods that changed. So if you implement a fast transport system into a city, into your settlement, you change all the structures. You change the structures of living, you change the structures of buildings, you change the structures of your social relationships, of the cultural stuff, and so on. You see, it fits quite well to the uh, high skyscraper buildings on the left-hand side, but it's completely distorted and it doesn't fit well on the right-hand side to the historical city centers based on walking. So there's a huge incompatibility on this, with this infrastructure. We had an uh, old traditional architect uh, in Austria which, who was called Friedensreich Hundertwasser, uh, and he did a uh, manifesto in 1985 where he said the ruler is the symbol of the new illiteracy and the ruler is the symptom of the new disease of decay. Uh, maybe we have to update it in a little bit and put instead of the ruler there the computer and the computer edit design we are using today because we're losing all the relation to nature and to length, to dimensions and to, to human scale. And these are the results in the city. We're discussing about buildings, we're discussing about sustainability, sustainability buildings, but what do we see when we take a look on the world and the mega cities and the big cities and also there's a picture here from Vienna nearby a motorway, which is quite clear that these uh, building types are along or aside a motorway, we find this way of living. And these are flats for people and not for a corporation or something else. So what produces the transport systems? It produces a new way of living, especially the fast transport system in accordance to the car. So it doesn't, it's not only a matter of the energy source. We can switch from one energy source to another, but what remains in the system are these disparities, are these inequalities between different societies. And the question is how, not only how do we want to live, but the more important question is what is sustainable for the planet. Is it the right way of living with fences and so on, and maybe some swimming pools in each plot size? Or on the left-hand side, the so-called informal settles, settlements that were destroyed also by different, uh, city governments and city administrations. And you see, it's a question of money. We come back what we've heard before, because the current money system leads to social disparities, it leads to a high consumption of resources and to a damage of environment. The money system destroys the world, as it is focused today. It's nothing new, going back even Illich, an Austrian, uh, scientists, I would say, did this literature energy and equity. It's not only a question, as I mentioned, of the source of energy, it's a question on the amount of energy consumption. That's very important. That what, that's what we see before, just on the individual level, so this correlation between income measured as GDP, not or measured as well-being, but the traditional term of wealth measured as GDP and the so-called income and uh, the CO2 gas emissions increasing by increasing income. There were different surveys where they take a, took a look and said, well, what about different societies? What about the societies that had, have low income, missioned as, uh, missioned, um, uh, uh, with the monetary system uh, measured, and high income societies like Austria? And you see there are societies that have on the social, which are in the inner circle aspects, there are on the social goals, uh, they have their problems, so they do not reach the social goals like life satisfaction and so on, and education and health uh, systems. But there are also countries that are green in the inner circle, in the social aspects, that, but they were completely red concerning the natural resources. Uh, like CO2 emissions, but also like biodiversity and so on. And there is no country 
around the globe that has inner circle green and the outer circle green. And that's, quite, that's a huge exercise. Find a system, develop a system, and think about what makes it necessary to get both circles green. Or maybe there was already some kind of society around the globe 10, 30, 40,000 years ago that was able to solve all these problems. And what were the preconditions for those societies? Because what is quite clear on the right-hand side, this is not sustainable, because if everything gets red in the outer circle, sometimes everything in the inner circle will get red, because you can't live in a destroyed country. Maybe you can uh, put it to another country and hope that they will send you supply with some goods and some food over decades or some years, but you're not sustainable at all. So we have this problem that we have this inequality in those structures, in the monetary systems. I want to give you some, uh, maybe some insp uh, inspirations also. There's a, a few uh, short films you can see. Uh, this one is called Dystopia. I mentioned what, how do the city administration react? They have this picture, well, those, the informal settlements, they may be more and more uh, environmental friendly and more sustainable than the other ones, than the new ones, the more comfortable ones, they have to get rid of. It's, it doesn't matter how the social relationships there are, we have to destroy them. We have to get rid of these informal settlements. They're dirty and so on. And uh, this is a good uh, film, Dystopia. And another one uh, is Rift Finifi, where you can see how urbanization destroys people's life. Uh, also quite interesting. Take a look at these pictures and maybe you, you will see or these films and you, you will think different. That it doesn't make sense to copy a system that is not sustainable at all and try to put the system and copy it and paste it everywhere around the globe. And that's the American way of living for decades now, maybe uh, Chinese way of living and so on. So what is our role? If we want to change behavior, we have to change the structures. That is quite clear. And your role as, a pl as planners and engineers uh, is that you have to develop a plan how to change the structures because they are planned, they are man-made. And there is this connection between inner and outer world, how we are influenced from the outer world in our thinking because the thinking, our mental map, is a product of the outer world. So try to get rid of all you've heard before and try to start from the beginning. Try to take a neutral look as far as possible because you also have a lot of preconditions, as I also have, to take a look on what are the real problems. So every goal of tomorrow works from yesterday's intentions to act today. What happened? Well, we destroyed public space. It looked like before we had already all the sustainability we're discussing and uh, expect today. This is how it looks like today, an example from Vienna City. We get rid of the people on the surface and put, it to, put them to the underground. And then we know, well, the effects that didn't occur on the engineering discipline, well, they occurred on the social uh, sciences. And they first t took a look and saw, well, the number of friendships and acquaintances is declining and is reducing by the number of increasing cars going to the cross, uh, through the cross-section of a street in my neighborhood. The more and more cars, the less, and, the less and less social relationships in my community, in my neighborhood, in my surroundings. And this is an old survey from Apple Yard in the 90s, but which is also maybe is a little bit more interesting for you is that they also ask the people, how do you define your home territory? And you see on the left picture, where heavy traffic, a lot of cars go through the cross-section, the home territory is defined as the flat or some rooms inside the house. And the less cars go, so the more attractive the public space became, the more and more the people feel responsible for the outsides. And they included the inside and combined it with the outside where they meet other people, where they can see what happens, where they can watch people work, where they can see interact, where they can get integrated and discuss, and whatever a society mean, uh, needs. So coming to an end, that's the real problem. We have these linear expectations. We expect every year 2% of growth. Our social system, our educational system, our everything is in accordance to the expectations that we will have more money, that we can invest more next year. We can do the same we did the last decades. 
But the real behavior, the real perception of reality is log in a logarithmic way. So if you all know that when you're drunk or when you start to drink or when you get dependent on drugs, you need every time more and more to get the same feeling. And this is what, how we behave or you enter a dark room. In the first second you see nothing and over 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 50 minutes, your eyes adapt to the dark surroundings and we begin to move and orient in this dark room. So it's a perception of the reality. But what about this gap? When the gap between our perception of reality and the expectation becomes bigger and bigger over time, well, we have to react in, exponential, uh, in an exponential way to meet these expectations. And therefore, we have this, this force on every level to invest, to do more, to do more, and to uh, fulfill our expectations. So this linear expectation and the logarithmic percep perception inevitably lead to the exponential interventions what we see and which leads, of course, to all the problems. So the sustainable is a question of the optimal size and the scale. And you see on the right-hand side, I did my PhD to this. I'm a civil engineer, but I did also my PhD to this stuff, the tumor growth. And if you take a look, typical tumor growth on the right-hand side, you see that the tumor growth is more and more stable a certain amount of time. But then when it begins to grow, you have the, the problems begin. It's uh, so-called tumor angiogenese. So he produces his own network inside your body and he pulls all the resources to his growth. In the end, all dies, like the expectation of the system is, is in, in the economic level as well. So try to uh, change things and things can be changed also on the large scale. At the end, a typical example from Seoul, you may be familiar with that, a motorway, inner city motorway, 200,000 cars per day uh, going through the city and the, and the mayor said, well, I have to, uh, we have to deconstruct it uh, and present a different way of social uh, and, and public uh, space for the city, which was the, so the, the same cross-section, and there was a river, uh, they opened it and gave back to the people. And last slide, I also suggest you this new book from David Graeber, I'm not quite sure if you know him, he wrote this book, Depths, and also Biocracy, and he did this new one, it's called Anfänge in German, and it's called The Dawn of Everything. And it's a very, very good, comprehensive, although it has more than 600 pages, but it is a very comprehensive uh, back cast and look on the 30, 40,000 years of human mankind. And he's questioning some myth and some, I would, so, would say, also paradigm that we take and took for granted. So take a look inside it. It's really good. And maybe it helps you to see how different societies organized themselves they do not and didn't wait to come uh, from the higher hierarchy, uh, top-down, an initiative, but they organized themselves bottom-up, also in bigger societies, not only in small settlements, also in cities. He gave some examples. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> so. so thank you very much to all the speakers and panelists. Uh, right now, it's actually the time to increase your energy consumptions in terms of caffeine and sugar because there will be a break with um, coffee and cake. But before you leave, there's some announcements. So we have half an hour break, so please be back at around 7, 10 p.m. And I would kindly ask the Summer University organization team and the speakers to come to the front to take a group picture. All the students, please find Lisa and Benjamin. They will take you to the third floor where there is a buffet. There's also a buffet uh, here in the back, but I think there's more space downstairs, so just choose wherever you want to go. And to those online, you won't have cake and coffee, but you can also have a one-on-one -on -one networking experience via the live stream. If you go to the menu bar on the left, you should find a point called networking, where you can match up with someone and talk to them. And if you just want to stay here, you'll see all the sponsors and partners of the summer universities. See you in half an hour. Just raise your hand, please, if you have a question.
But also those online can ask questions um, via the tool Slido. It should appear behind me any second. So you just use the Slido link and ask your questions there. And Lisa over there will be so nice and read them out for us. Yes. So to start with, and so that we're all on the same page, a question all four of you have avoided in your presentation is how can we achieve a good life for all within planetary boundaries? So I would kindly ask all four of you to make a short statement what it means for you. I will start over there. So that's a, in my, in my opinion, very scientific question and I don't feel like I'm enough scientifically, uh, you know, uh, I know uh, too much about it. Um, what it means for me, what we can do to achieve a good life for everyone in these global boundaries, I think is just to take a step back, look at what, what we really need to have, because that's a thing that we do a lot in this um, society to have more than we need. Look what we have to have, look what we really need, and see how it's possible to have to let, to let everyone have what they need. Um, so I think really thinking globally, thinking, thinking for everyone, not for ourselves, um, on this more of a like meta level, not really scientific, but like for our, for our thinking, not to think of ourselves, think of others, think um, empathetically, think of people that are already affected um, not talk about how we in Austria should adapt to climate change when, when people are already affected in, in other areas and really feel it. So, yeah, in my opinion, um, keep, on, keep on developing this, these interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary attempts to, to solve this problem together as, as the world, as, as the humankind population. And now, Mr. Weizsäcker, the scientific point of view, what does it mean for you? What does a good life for all within the planetary boundaries mean? It's a wonderful wish, not easy to fulfill. I'd like to respond to the third um, question by Anonymous. I have to apologize for not having expressed myself properly. I never would say that Austria's doing good things like climate uh, protection is in any way insignificant. What I say was, in terms of physics, the amount of reduced carbon dioxide is tiny. and. On the other hand, I immediately say, it, but it is great if Austria shows how much you can do for your own country and internationally so that it does make a difference. May I just add to this? Unfortunately, in climate issues, we are not this model. We don't, don't, we are not this model country. We don't do enough. Certainly not enough. But we we have played an important international role. For instance, in uh, reducing ozone destructing, destru destroying um, substances, uh, where Austrian diplomacy can can uh, really be helpful, uh, because nobody is threatened by the small country. So they and, and the self-interests are limited. Uh, so Austria really can play an important role in international politics. Uh, we did this for ozone. We also did it for nuclear disarmament. Uh, so there are examples where Austrian role in international negotiations was important. Uh, however, of course, in the climate issue, you can only play such a role if you if you do your homework. And so far, we're not really doing our homework. So for climate, uh, uh, we, we have, um, the wish was expressed by our former chancellor that we would become the climate leaders of the world. Well, 
we're far from it, unfortunately. Uh, but I fully agree with you that the role Austria can play is not so much the, the amount of carbon dioxide we can reduce, uh, but it is the, the example. Because um, I think it's important to realize that um, um, developing countries rightly say, uh, we are now asking them to make do with less, uh, but uh, we are on a level that is much higher. So I think it's obvious we all need to reduce, but I think it's our obligation, it's an, it's an ethical but also a, a real obligation uh, to show that uh, we are willing to change our uh, lifestyle, uh, because that's what it amounts to, to change our lifestyle, to make do with less. But the nice thing about it, and that maybe answers your question, is um, I think this change is change for the better, even for the individual person. I mean, if we walk more, bicycle more, take public transport more, we're healthier. We live in a healthier environment, we have a cleaner air, we have less noise, uh, our children are, are safer when on their way to school, we don't have to take them there, uh, so we save time. Uh, a huge number of advantages that we could uh, gain by uh, doing climate, uh, doing, uh, climate uh, action in a, in a sensible way. And I can explain the same thing about uh, food. Uh, the food that, that we should be eating is uh, uh, regional, uh, bio, biological, uh, less meat, seasonal food. All of that is better, healthier, tastier food. At the same time, it helps our farmers. Uh, it helps uh, save the soil and uh, uh, make the soil more, uh, more um, uh, raise the capacity of the soil to take up moisture, which means that it is not so threatened in case of a lot of rain, so we don't have as many floods, and if we have very little rain, the soil remains moist for a longer period of time. So there's any number of advantages, and the question is really why aren't we doing it independent of climate change? So I think the good life for all, uh, within the planetary boundaries is not something which is difficult to bring together, but in fact, it really goes hand in hand. Um, certainly for our, for our uh, industrialized nations, uh, but uh, I'm sure it is also a good solution for the developing world, even though the pathway there is a different one from our pathway. Getting back to mobility, in, especially in Austria, the car is like a really important status symbol. So how do you get people away of, of the thinking that a good life means that you have your SUV parked in your garage, that there is also something different that could also be, lead to a good life? Yeah, and meanwhile, it's, it's not just uh, one car, but we're talking about the second and the third cars in the household. So it's still growing, the degree of motorization. Uh, so I think, uh, first of all, the people have to realize that they are in a trap. Uh, they were dependent from industry. Uh, and they were made, uh, this dependence was made over the decades. Uh, of course, with this dependence, they were able to reduce their dependence from nature, uh, which seemed to be very comfortable in a short way, but very uh, critical in a long way. And we see now the first effects. So I, I think uh, the people have, have to think what, how can they get uh, undependent from this system uh, which made the dependency and is, is called, of course also made uh, dependent from earning money. So the people are trained over the decades to earn money, to invest the money in something that maybe they do not need or that makes them dependent from the bigger industries. Uh, I remember my grandfather and all other generation, generations before, they were able to repair things. They were able to uh, think about what they really need. Uh, they invested time in different things uh, that, where they do not have to consume something. So uh, we are in this trap of consumer addiction and the car, as you mentioned, is, one, is a bigger part because there's a huge industry which, which profits that you work. Even Illich, with, uh, which, uh, who I mentioned, uh, did the survey in the US in the 1970s where he uh, stated that uh, four days of the five days week uh, the people work for their cars because they invest so much money uh, for their car and for this way of mobility and made them dependent. 
There is an interesting survey in Germany when there was the oil, oil crisis in the 1970s. We had here in Austria one day off our car when the people put some slides inside the car when they, the day of the week when they leave, the, 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 the car stays at home or at the garage. And in Germany there was uh, the car free Sundays. And there was an interesting study where they showed that nine months after the invention of this car free sun, uh, Sunday, the number of births uh, increased so that uh, when the men, especially the men, di didn't clean the car on weekdays, they did something else. Uh, so you see that there is an interesting correlation between what we do for products, for industries, for things that made us dependent, or we can do something else. Uh, and I think th that the people uh, get conscious that the, sh that the time of life is very short and they should think about what they really want to do. They are made, they de made uh, the dependence, the degree of dependency is on so many levels. Uh, Helga showed that and mentioned it, it's uh, what we eat, it's what we do, what we work. Think on the book of David Graeber, it's called Bullshit Jobs. Yeah? So the people just go somewhere and do something so that they can earn money to invest in the system which produces CO2, as we see in, in the global level and also on the individual ones. So, we have to question the whole system on every level uh, and maybe that's a good thing to ask, well, are we happy with this life, with this society, with this way of uh, working, of living, uh, just to get, stand up in the morning, go out, work 40 hours, earn some money to invest it in the systems. Yeah? Put the children in the kindergarten, outsource the problems to some countries around the globe and so on. So I think it's a good point of time. This peak of everything can also uh, lead us, give us the possibility. It's not uh, said it will happen in that way, but gives us potential to ask, to critically ask and question uh, habits and comments. Just a short comment, population growth is not part of the solution. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I guess Mr. Weizsäcker would have something to add here too. On the, on the theory whether population growth is part of the solution to have a car-free uh, day and a rise of births uh, nine months later. You see, you see, it's what is an example for the deep connection of the car with the human being. Essentially, as everybody knows, in Western Europe and even more so in Eastern Europe, we have a population stabilization. And so it is the case in Japan. The only place where it absolutely does, does not occur is Africa. But the typical answer to that challenge is we have to educate the girls and women. This is not the whole truth. What is more important in my view is that African countries governments are too poor to establish economic safety for the elderly, the pension system. This leads to the inevitable discussion among young couples to create as many children as possible because they will then be responsible for for us when we are old. So, in my new book, I'm saying we in the North should help developing countries, chiefly in Africa, to get prosperous enough to afford a, a financial system to make the elderly happy which is simply not the case now, and that leads to overpopulation. So something you said before um, is, you were talking about the 1970s, and we heard many times today that the knowledge is there, it has been there for, for quite a while now. How do you feel both as scientists and as well as, as climate activists, do you feel hurt by policymakers? I'll maybe start with you, Annika. I think I feel hurt. I don't think I feel quite understood or act like I feel, I don't feel like they act upon what they hear. 
So I've talked to many politicians and they say things like, oh, you young people, you give me so much hope and um, you're so inspirational, we look up to you. And they talk about different things and how they can, how, what they personally do to reduce their own individual carbon footprint. So they know about the problems, they kind of listen to us, they, want, they, they hear what we want to say, but, the, but they don't act on it. Not, not always, not often. Um, so I think the problem is that they can still do that, that they can still not act on the climate crisis and still be elected again. Um, and I think that's a problem. It's the problem that the people are told that the climate crisis is not that big of a problem so that they tolerate our politicians not acting upon it. I think that like there the cat bites itself in, in its tail because how do people know that the climate crisis is a problem if the politicians don't educate them? Um, so I think that's our job to do, to educate the people about how big of a problem it actually is and that politicians should do their job in protecting our way, our living, our, the humankind um, by doing their job and, you know, um, yeah, like leading society. As a mobility expert in Austria, the mobility sector is the only sector where emissions keep rising since the 1990s. How do you feel about that? If, if you talk about the science for quite a while, but nothing has changed. Yeah, that fulfills my expectations of the political system. Uh, and the question is, uh, do, what do we expect from the politicians? I think, uh, and I have, uh, do not have these expectations that uh, there will be radical changes in, from, coming from inside the system. Because all of those who have the political power inside the systems have this power because they try to look that everything goes the same procedure as every year. And follows the next year, is the following next year should not radically change something. So I think if we have to want to change something, then each of us can do this on its or his or her individual level. And uh, therefore you have, you have possibilities, you have degrees of freedom. And I think uh, this, is, this should be or will be the focus. Of course, but uh, there are, uh, and this is a question of scales, of course, because you mentioned the national level and the increase uh, of uh, CO2 gas emissions from the mobility sector. But we have, of course, on the level of communities and on small scale initiative level, good examples where you can change things. So I think, uh, and this gives uh, maybe the optimistic view on the system, where can the change begin? And I think the change already began by a lot of people who start to think different, think on the energy consumption and uh, solar initiatives, think on the so-called Energiegemeinschaften in Österreich, in Austria, where people find together and uh, the one supports the other, which is a typical uh, instrument of societies that we support those who do not have the same chances, the same opportunities, the same tools, and so on. So I think, uh, and this is the result of every crisis, that the people have to begin to find together to support themselves, because that's the basis for every society. We've learned in the past 50, 70 years that it's the most comfortable thing to do not take care of other people, to be egoistic, to, to buy, to build my own swimming pool, to build my own house, to build a huge fence around my house, to have my own car where I can sit on my own, although I have five seats inside my car, and so on. Uh, and now we have to think in a, in a, on a societal level more and more, and I think that's uh, becoming uh, the crucial thing in this, in this whole discussion. Are we able to give up egoism, and are we able to find back to uh, the key issues of societies uh, which made the growth of societies uh, 20, 30, 40,000 years ago, uh, or will we lose? I'll pass that question on. Will we be able to get away from our egoistic behavior? 
I have great confidence in human beings. I have great confidence that, that uh, we are able to change. I mean, we have changed so often. We are, we're quite able to change. Uh, I think we, I mean, we, we worked with narratives today uh, in, our, in our summer school, and I think that's what we need. We need narratives uh, of the good life that we want to have. And um, as uh, we all noticed today, it is very difficult to, to find such narratives which um, uh, people can agree on, on the one hand, but on the other hand also which, um, uh, where, we, where we free ourselves of classical thinking or the way we were brought up. Uh, I think imagining that things could be completely different from what they are is one of the most difficult things. And that's what we really need now. Um, just one example I heard by somebody, I can't remember who, I think it was a, uh, some, some uh, philosophical uh, science scientist. Uh, he said, just imagine that if um, every child born on a specific day uh, on, in the world were just um, by lottery passed on to any of the parents that, uh, or the women that that uh, uh, gave birth that day. So you would get a child, but you don't know whose it is, and your child will be somewhere, you don't know where. Um, what difference would it make to you? I mean, I'm sure you would love the child you get, but at the same time, you'd always think, how do I need to act to make sure that my child, wherever it is, is also not suffering? So suddenly you will start thinking, not just for yourself and the child you have with you, but you will start thinking, for all the children. Uh, and that would make a huge difference in the way we act, or it could make a huge difference in the way we act. Now, he did not propose that we do this, but it's just, it just shows you that we, that we need uh, ideas that are maybe not even meant to be realized, but that help us to get rid of all the, all the, the the traditional thinking that, uh, that ties us to solutions which are no longer valid. Um, and if it turns out that uh, that idea does not, is not productive in the sense of a future vision, well, then we'll just drop it. But we must try to get rid of this, uh, of, of uh, I mean, so many things, we will, for instance, be doing an exercise probably, what about a world without money? Uh, and it turns out it's not that difficult. We could imagine a world without money. It would have a lot of advantages. We would be rid of a lot of problems. Um, yeah, and if you start thinking like that, then you find that there's so many things which we take for granted that they must be the way they are, and they mustn't. It's not necessary. Another thing which probably would uh, shock very many people, what if... Um, the, the piece of land you own does no longer belong to you. For most of the history of mankind, land did not belong to the person living there. And in many parts of the world, it still is that way. Um, in, in Europe, it, was, it belonged uh, essentially to God, and God passed it on to some, some nobles, and they uh, uh, let other people work on their land their land, which wasn't their land, and the king could at any time take the land from them. Uh, now we have this absolute uh, uh, ownership idea, uh, and it's very difficult to let go of it. But I think we need to do these mental exercises to find out what we really need to let go of, because it will make things easier and better, and what we should cling to, because it makes sense to have it. I ask for the floor because you are not physically able to read that. So, uh, I have seen a fairly large number of questions and, uh, well, critique of us for misinterpreting the situation of Africa and other developing countries. And on that, I would like to respond that I find it extremely important for us Europeans to acknowledge that colonialism was a sin, was destructive. It was perhaps good for, for Europe for a while, but nowadays it is 
the topic which makes half of the world hating the West. We have to work very hard in working for justice north-south. And then there is one uh, little question to me in particular. How can I survive uh, if I say so many things uh, since decades? Uh, I believe it's already gone. Um, uh, and still there is so much ignorance. I say, oh, I'm extremely happy, I must say. I mean, the other three uh, persons here on the uh, panel are so fabulously positive in identifying the problems and uh, parts of the solution, I uh, couldn't be happier. Before we get to, to some more questions from Slido, uh, I would like to pass on the, the former question to you. Why is there such a big gap between the known science there is and the uh, decisions politicians make? You were a former politician, so you know both sides, the scientist side and the politician side. I see with a high degree of pain that today um, criticizing politicians, it was what nearly everybody wants. Politicians are the bad ones. That's populism. And it typically ignores the fact that it is the electorate that forces politicians into the wrong direction. Maybe I can, can add one thing. I, I remember sitting on a panel in Vienna with uh, politicians and talking about climate politics for Vienna. And they talked about everything, about food, about but they didn't talk about traffic. They didn't talk about mobility. And so I said, well, we're missing a point here. Mobility is also an issue. And the politician said, um, talking about mobility in connection with climate is suicide, political suicide, so we will not do it. And to a certain extent, they are right, because as soon as they touch uh, the car, uh, everybody's baby, uh, then uh, they are in trouble. So I think that is true, but it's only part of the truth, because we also have had politicians who we are courageous enough uh, to, to call things by the name and really talk about what needs to be done and uh, then do it. And there might have been some uproar for about a week or two, maybe a month, but after that it's forgotten. But the thing is done. And so I think that is something which we, should, uh, which we can also expect our politicians to dare. It's another thing I want to add is um, the job of politics also in a democracy is to enable peeping, people living together in peace. So it's the whole point of why we even have politics is that society works in such large numbers. So also if, if you keep thinking about that, in order for us to live together in peace, it's p the job of politicians to ensure that and part of that job is also climate action to ensure that. Because if we don't act on climate change, the whole geopolitical um, effects it has, um, you know, refugees, because country, whole countries become inhabitable, these are things that today's politicians have to make sure that don't happen. So I think it's inherent in politics that they should care about the future, about the future of countries, about the future of the world, so that there's, they, don't have to need, they don't have to need a reason to do climate action, is what I mean. They don't have to be elected just to do climate action and to, to protect the climate. I think it's, it's such an inherent, inherent part of politics that there shouldn't be a discussion about it. Now, we're far away from that, so I totally get your point. Um, also, I, in Austria right now, I think it's an interesting situation because there are some politicians that deeply care about the issue 
and also partly come from climate activism or envir environmental activism. And I see how much they fight and how much they really want to change things. And I also see how they're talking to walls and how they have to trade things in order to achieve climate action. And that's how politi politics works in Austria and in very many other parts of the world as well. But I think we need to get away from this discussion whether climate action is a political question that can be discussed like any other question. I think we have to get to a point sooner rather than later where it's not, it's not, it's not an issue anymore if we do it or not. It's like we care for climate just like we care for other things that are normal right, right now. In, for example, there shouldn't be a Greens party anymore, in my opinion. My, my son radical, but there shouldn't be one party caring about the environment and the climate. Every party should do that inherently. Um, so that's my point of view. Something you want to add about talking uh, about crisis, suicide, political suicide? It's not completely false because uh, 70 years we built up for 70 years we built up a system that made the people the life more comfortable and more easy. And the car is part of this. That's what was communicated. We built you a house. You get the house and you get the garage and you get the car. And that's all of transport planning we have to think of. That's what it was, and uh, and still is in the majority. And uh, the car produced its own structures. The car produced the shopping center somewhere outside. The car produced my working place somewhere far away. And commuters that have to go 20, 30, 40, 50 kilometers or further over the decades. And now someone comes and say, well, we get rid of the car. Well, the people say, well, I need the car. I need the car to go shopping. I need the car to go to work. I need the car to go to my friends, etc., etc." And that's the problem. Uh, and therefore, I criticize that it's very, on the one hand, it's very difficult to change the structures immediately. And we have to make small steps, although all these small steps in total are not enough. And on the other hand, the biggest problem is that we still build new car infrastructure. We still build new car infrastructures, although we know that it will reproduce the, re the dependencies for the next generation and reproduce the structures, the wrong structures, that are not sustainable in, in the environmental uh, sense. So this is the, that's the biggest problem and my biggest criticism that we copy the failures of the past today, still. Uh, and we put a lot of money in the wrong system. Right now, we put billions of euros per year to support and to uh, enhance uh, and strengthen a wrong system. And that's, that's the real problem. We have to refurbish, we have to transform existing structures. That is not that easy. But building wrong infrastructure is the biggest failure uh, ever you can do today. And a lot of money is put into wrong infrastructures. Believe me, I, can a lot of pro I know a lot of projects in Austria where, we, where I say, well, we are reproducing all the things we, criticize, we criticism, we're doing criticize uh, for decades. And that's, that's really uh, not responsible. Uh, but of course, it uh, is, the politicians say, well, we do that because the people want that, and the people say we want it because we want this, the life we had before and we do not want to change, some of them. Yeah, and that's quite clear. We had, uh, I think it was now really nearly seven or ten years ago a discussion with Dennis Meadows here at Technical University uh, which had the title uh, Can Democracy Survive Climate Change? So of course it's a question how and maybe that's also when we discuss we have to discuss about all levels of society so democracy and I'm a friend of democracy of real democracy not of uh, uh, representative democracy but of direct democracy to check out well, how can we change things bottom up? I do not expect that top down we will, uh, there will come a lot. But we have to find together in groups, in small groups, in our, our communities uh, and in our neighborhoods, 
to begin to think about how we want to live. In uh, former societies, there was for 100, 155, 150 people, uh, for every of those groups, a room like this one, where they find together in periodic times, every month, where they think, where they discuss as a group how they want to live, what they need for a good life, where are the problems of society, and so on. And I, do, I, I miss that in the cities, if you ask, where can the people find together and discuss the future of the neighborhood? How should the streets should look like? Uh, what are the problems? Uh, do we have uh, enough space for children, and so on? Society is given up. It says, well, especially in a good administrative city like Vienna, they say, well, the politicians have to do or the administration have to do and have to solve the problem. No, we have to solve the problem. If we wait for the politician to solve the problem, you can give it up. We have to solve the problem. And if that means that we have to uh, make, make a force and that we have to change something in a radical way, then, of course, that's part of the system. That's part of the change process. But uh, do not expect that out of the traditional paradigm uh, you have to ex expect a change. And it will not come. Let's do exactly this. Let's open this wonderful room here for a discussion. First of all, I would ask Lisa to maybe read out the first two questions with the most, I think, thumbs up. <coughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so the first question from the audience. For people early in their careers, what are some key leverage points to focus on that have strategic value in rapidly encouraging radical systemic change? And I will add the second question as well. Do we have to stop our current economic system to stop climate change? Because capitalism forces many companies to well, handle with climate-friendly methods. Let me ask, uh, answer with essentially one sentence. If we manage to make prices on markets tell the ecological truth, your problem will be solved. The trouble is now that it doesn't cost a penny to do the wrong things because we are too uh, anxious to make prices tell the ecological truth. I think that's a big part of what needs to happen, but I don't think it's the whole truth. Um, we still will we'll still have a financial system that redistributes wealth from the poor to the rich, uh, even if we have ecologically correct prices. Uh, so I think we also need to of changes here. Empirically, this is not established because we have only prices that lie. That's true, but we also have a system, uh, a system that uh, uh, with the more money you have, the easier it is to make more money. And that is independent of the, of the prices. Because we have, a, we have a financial system that has a completely uh, decoupled itself from the economic system. And I think this financial system is also something we really need to look at. Because there's much more money in the purely financial system than there's in the, in the real economy. And uh, uh, I think that is, uh, that is an issue that really needs to be addressed. I completely agree. I think the financial system definitely needs some changing. Um, on the other hand, if we just look at the, do we, can we work against the climate crisis in the system of capitalism? For me, the answer is we have to, for now at least, because we cannot wait for the system to change or change the system and then start acting on climate change. So we have to start now, see how far we get within the system and change it on our way. We cannot discuss whether we want to continue with capitalism or not and actually it's not a discussion any politician has ever led in reality. So for me, it's a more, the, the do we do capitalism or not is a more philosophical question that we can think about now, but we actually need to act now. We should have acted yesterday. We should have acted 10 years ago. 
so we don't have time to change our system before starting to act. Two things when inter trying to start internalizing costs, and I'm in principle, I'm, 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 I agree it's important that we integrate or that we uh, began to take a view on the externalized costs. The problem, of course, is that trying to uh, monetize different values, you have to have a common, a common basis. Because why is the working hour in Bangladesh just one cent or 10 cents in euros and in Austria 20 euros, 10 euros, 15 euros, whatever? What makes the difference? Uh, in size and in scale. Uh, on the one hand, the discussion of monetizing is of course also on all natural resources. How big is the value of one cubic meter soil or on, of one uh, ton CO2? So we have this permanent uh, discussion. Is it the truth? Is it the tr are these the true costs? And the second point is, in the globalized uh, good change, you need complete transparency to have a visible a visibility on this truth because everyone will try to hide the costs uh, in order to gain profit. Uh, so we still don't know the complete uh, food chains, we still don't know uh, the products where they come from and that are placed in our supermarkets and we consume. If you ask the retailers where do they come from, well, they say one or two stations and then, well, it's going somewhere to Vietnam or somewhere around the globe. They do not know where the things really come from. So it's completely invisible for the customers. So there are a lot of problems occurring in a globalized good change, of course, if you want to internalize external and exter external costs, of course. In principle, it's in theory, I would totally agree, but I don't think that it's, it will lead us to, to uh, success. Looking at, maybe I would, I would like to add something to this, um, uh, do we have to wait for the revolution before we can start saving the climate? I don't think so, I, I, I don't see the revolution coming, so, so we'd better not wait for it. Uh, but I do think that, um, by uh, addressing climate issues, by making, by, by changing things, we also change the system. Uh, one of the, I think you mentioned that the circular economy, uh, one of the, uh, the circular economy is something which is more or less generally accepted and we need to have it. I don't think many people have thought about what it really means, but uh, we need to have it. So, uh, but if we do that, uh, there's really substantial changes, substantial changes in how goods are produced and how, uh, what, what, uh, what durability they have, what repairability, what recyclability, reproductibility, and so on they have. So I think this changes a lot of things. So the changes occur within the system. Uh, what I think we really need to take care of or be, be aware of is that um, there's, there were so many positive ideas and changes that then somehow, somehow were diverted uh, to become uh, another support for a, a, a um, system of, of waste and, and, and consumption. And we have to make sure that the, that the changes that we, we trigger and that we make uh, do not um, become traps to, into the wrong direction. Like immobility, no? Like yeah. Now we say we get rid of all the old cars, buy new ones, and then we will survive. I mean, that's complete nonsense. There was a second question about uh, career, career advice. Who of you would like to answer it briefly before we get some more questions here in the room? I, I, I think that career decisions are decisions that are not only um, where well, it's not only relevant the situation of society, but also your own your own um, um, strength and weaknesses and your own engagement. I think no matter what position, what career you take, what what position you 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 uh, uh, reach or are in 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 life, uh, you can do something there. And um, um, so I, I don't. What I think what you need is basic knowledge, 
so I think that's important that you, you get basic knowledge and then that you increase that knowledge in whatever uh, position or career you have chosen uh, and then you can work there. There are some, some people who prefer working in a field uh, where there's others, other like-minded people, for instance, go to an NGO, a climate NGO. Uh, there's other people who, who like to fight. Maybe they should go to an oil, oil company or to an arms, arms uh, production uh, team and, and work there. So I think you can, you can be useful anywhere. Um, but uh, just be sure that uh, if you go into a hostile environment, that you keep touch with um, people who have your original ideals, because the environment does also um, change you. So um, you, you need to be grounded, firmly grounded, uh, in order to, to maintain your values in such a system. Regarding um, consultancies, advising the young. I am terribly annoyed because 90% of what they say is go for digitization. So let's go analog here and open the podium to all of you. I think there's only time for two more questions, unfortunately, so who has one? I see there's one back there. Uh, there's a microphone on the way. Please wait for it. And I think we have time for a second question. And there's a second one over there on the right afterwards. Thank you. Um, Mr. Woolbrick, uh, you have mentioned that you would like to add the economical cost to the price of cost. How do you think offsetting the prices towards the poor and the working class will solve anything? How will that stop Jeff Bezos having another mega yacht? How will that stop Elon Musk taking his private jet anywhere? I failed to see how putting the price and the failures of the bourgeoisie class on the consumer will save anything. Again, I have looked at your Wikipedia page. I have seen that you have represented the SPD in the Bundestag. The SPD has done nothing but to maintain the status quo since 1958. More coal power plants have been opened under the SPD than the CDU. All the nuclear power, most of the nuclear power plants have been closed. And the SPD is the uh, party which approved Nord Stream 2. How do you, in your own good conscience, say the things you say now and take part in the very system that allows climate change to happen? Thank you. I am very happy hearing a socialist speaking. I think the questions were all dedicated to you. <laughs> Let me give you one example. I was elected for Bundestag for the Social Democrats and my chief interest was to increase costs of energy and other raw materials, the so-called ecological tax reform. And then some people, speaking like you, said, oh, no, 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 that is unjust. We must compensate something so that the poor in the country will benefit, not be punished. And I said, yes, of course. And what we then did was, using most of the fiscal income for reducing the labor, the indirect labor costs, which led to a situation where, for Germany, some 300,000 jobs were created or um, saved. And that was in a broad uh, part of society accepted as an ecological tax reform everybody was, or nearly everybody was, happy with. And that was good socialism by the SPD. So to, to move back from, from, pol from German policy to this room here, there was another question on the side somewhere. 
Um, yes, I have a very Austria-specific question because I know the numbers for Austria, but I think uh, the key problem um, applies to many other, especially European countries. Um, in Austria, there is at the moment a uh, law in the pipeline that wants to decarbonize the whole heating sector, um, the Erneuerbare Wärmegesetz, and it wants to phase out all gas, um, coal and oil heating systems until um, 2040. Um, but to achieve this, we need to switch uh, about 1.8 million heating systems from carbon to non-carbon heating systems. But to achieve this, we need to change 2,000 um, heating systems per week for the next uh, 900 months. But we just lack the people who can do this, the skilled people um, who can do the work to achieve this goal. Um, do you have any solutions or plans um, how this can be achieved? Because if we like the people, the task can be completed. Thank you. Who wants to answer this question? Well, I don't think there's, there's a simple answer, but part of the answer is certainly that, uh, and that's uh, what I've been also trying to discuss with, with some of the politicians, that we really need a, a strong offensive in, in um, um, training uh, young people, old people. There's a lot of elderly people who uh, uh, either want to quit their job because they don't find it satisfying or they have lost their job. Uh, they can just as well help in this transformation. You know, this transformation, this transformation is a transformation which does not need one centralized big company. It's something which can happen in every single village, which can happen in every single town, and uh, where possibly people can help quite a bit by themselves if you, if you give them the right uh, uh, information and the right equipment. It's not only a question of the capacity of the work, workforce capacity, it's of course at the moment also a question of the, of the availability of the, of the, um, the hardware, uh, but that too, uh, I mean, um, if the change from a peace economy to a war economy happens within days and weeks, uh, why shouldn't we be able to change something like this within weeks or maybe months? Um, if you look at, at um, um, the, the corona crisis, a hospital in China was built within a week to take up hundreds of patients. So things can be done if you really want, want to do them. You just have to, to really make the effort. Uh, and um, possibly this would also be something which, which could win over some of the obstacles that we have now in Austria. Uh, for instance, if the, if the, whatever that's in English, Wirtschaftskammer, uh, suddenly consider this to be their task to really uh, mobilize people to, to take on that job. Uh, they would suddenly become important, more important than they are now. Uh, and maybe they would, they would suddenly realize that change is also in, there's something in them for them in change. Um, I wouldn't be so defeatist. I think we can, we, we, we can achieve a lot if we want, if we want to. Um, and I think it's sort of a, a bit of a snowballing system. Uh, it sort of starts slow, but once the momentum is there, uh, it can grow rather rapidly, especially with the external pressures we have now. So things can change if you want them to change. If there is the momentum, maybe that's a good sentence to stop here and uh, maybe an input for all of you for the Sami universities. I know there are many more questions, but the good news is there's time for more discussions with some more food and some wine, and I hope that some of the panelists will also stay here and join you there. Thank you very much, all of you on the podium here. Thank you, everybody here and also online. Thank you for your questions. Sorry we couldn't answer or get to all of them. Before you leave, there are more announcements. So there's not only a buffet again here and downstairs on the third floor. I would also kindly ask all AEMS students to come here in the front to take a group picture together and afterwards all the GBS students to take a group picture together. And I hope you have a wonderful uh, experience here in Vienna. You have a great experience at the Summer Universities and thank you so much for being here. Thank you.